Brilliant. Let me pray for us um, as we come to God's word. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks. And we thank you for this, your word. Father, we pray that you would feed us by it now. Encourage our hearts and draw us to yourself. Amen. As we start in 1 Samuel 3, let me tell you two stories. The first is a story of a church. The second, the story of a person. They are stories that have been repeated many, many times um, through history in different people's lives and in different places. Yet in lots of ways, they're stories, they're copies of one another. So the church, St. Clement's by the wardrobe. It's not a real church, but it's a surprisingly close name to a real church. St. Clement's by the wardrobe had enjoyed several decades of what could best be described as summer. They had, as a church, a real sense of purpose, a sense of God's presence amongst them when they met. It was something that was hard to put your finger on and describe, but they felt alive. It felt like a place of real authentic faith. And over that season, the the ministries of the church, their involvement in the community life around them had grown and flourished. But more recently for some, it increasingly felt like autumn was coming. Like there was a sense of winter being on horizon. They'd been through ups and downs before, but this somehow felt a little bit different. It felt to them like the core or the centre of the church, if you like, was increasingly feeling empty. It wasn't if you looked from the outside in, it looked like the church was dying or there was something significantly wrong. There were still good numbers on a Sunday. There were still a busy kids and youth group. There were lots of the usual baptisms, marriages and funerals that go with church life. But in an odd way, it felt like the life was kind of ebbing away. Like God was somehow increasingly distant. Behind closed doors, conversations were happening as to what was different. What needed to change? Or was it okay just to carry on as things were? Robert's story, Robert is the individual of his story, is very similar to St. Clement's by the wardrobe. It wasn't that life was bad for him at the moment. And it wasn't that he was a he especially disliked the church that he was part of. He'd been going for years. He enjoyed the church. He enjoyed the friendships. He enjoyed the people, the conversations, the community. Yet he was feeling this gnawing sense that increasingly he was just going through the motions. Like he was just doing what he already, always had done. Like church was just another group he attended. For Robert, he felt this sense of awe this sense of excitement, the sense of wonder in God that he'd once had was increasingly absent. There was a sense of autumn having come for Robert too. These kind of seasons, they are common in both the lives of churches and the lives of individuals. And there can be all sorts of reasons for them. But it can be one of those things to watch out for. Because it is a pattern that we see in the Bible, this up, then this down, this up, then this down. Which means, at least in some cases, we get a little bit of an insight into why it might be happening. And the way back out. If you're in 1 Samuel, here we have a picture, if you like, of autumn having come to God's people. In, in some ways, things outwardly, they weren't terrible, were they? There was the temple, there was the priest, the sacrifices were still happening. People were going up to worship the Lord year on year. The normal patterns of life, they were happening. But at Israel's core, at the heart, there was a sense of emptiness. If you like, the soul of their life as God's people had begun to disappear. It was damaged, and the effects of that were beginning to work their way out into the rest of their life together. And at its core, what was missing was God, and in particular, his words. Claire said earlier where this story begins in verse 1. It starts like this. It says, Now, 
the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. The word was rare. God had always revealed himself to his people by his words. Think back to the beginning of the Bible, if you know it, and creation. What does God do? God speaks the creation into existence, the universe into existence. What if you know of Moses? Moses and the burning bush. What does God do to Moses? God speaks his word to Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. And he speaks to him. It's words that come out of the mist and the clouds on the top of Mount Sinai where God reveals those ten commandments that we read earlier. It's those words that were put in the holiest part of the temple to represent God himself, where his very present dwelt. There is a sense in the Bible that where God's word is absent, God is absent. And here in 1 Samuel, it's not quite that God has left the building, that is actually coming in a funny way, but it is already getting that way. What does that do when God's word is rare to God's people who are just going about all the normal things of life? What does it do if it's done without God's presence and without him there? Well, verse 2 of chapter 3 carries on, doesn't it? It paints the picture another way. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. Eli was the priest, and he was old. He was dying, and he was going blind. It's not just a physical thing. It was a physical thing that his eyes were dimming, but actually it's a spiritual thing too. Because we've seen words like this before, When one of God's other leaders, Moses, got towards the end of his life, he was 120, so he was pretty old by then. Deuteronomy, talking about that moment, specifically mentions for Moses that his eyes were undimmed, his vigour unabated. But here in Samuel, a big deal is made of the fact that Eli's eyes are failing him. And actually, a chapter later, he describes him as having gone blind. Eli is like a picture of what is happening for Israel. He could once see, but now there were very few visions from God. And Eli was slowly drifting into blindness. God's people, they once knew God, they were close to him, they experienced his very presence. But for now, a generation who whilst had kept the outward motions of of life as God's people they become increasingly distant from God himself here in 1 Samuel it's like we're in a kind of dead spot if you like between the outgoing generation and the new incoming one and in this moment no one seems to know God anymore Eli is failing his sons have failed Samuel in verse 7 if you noticed doesn't yet know God. Samuel will obviously have known lots of stuff about God. He was ministering to him in the temple. He knew what he was doing. But God hadn't yet revealed himself personally to Samuel. He hadn't yet started the next generation with his words. Sometimes that's how it can seem in church life. A sense of the lights going out. A sense that once God was working, once God was close, once his words felt near and were clear sounding. And yes, sometimes the church and churches can carry on for a time doing the things that they do. But if God's word is missing, if God's word is missing from the heart of it, then there is a sense in which God himself is missing. And isn't that sometimes how it seems in our own lives? We've probably all been there. Like the light is slowly going out. Like God is distant and far from us. Well, what's going to bring a change? What's going to actually do something about that? What's going to make a difference? Think back to St. Clement's by the wardrobe or Robert from the start. 
what's at the very least going to need to happen for them? Well, they need God to speak, to reveal himself again, to draw close. And that's what he does here in 1 Samuel, doesn't it? By this point, God speaking had become so unusual amongst his people that Samuel, he doesn't even recognize God's voice. It's almost a slightly comical moment. God says, Samuel. Samuel wakes up and goes, oh, where's Eli? And runs off to Eli and says, you called? And it happens again. But in verse 10, the Lord speaks to Samuel. And notice how it describes in that moment what happened in verse 10. It says, the Lord came and stood, calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. This is what God's people needed. God, he draws near to Samuel. He comes and stands, if you like, next to him. And he speaks to him. And he says he is going to act, he is going to do something about Eli and his sons. God's words here, they bring, don't they, both judgment and hope. The word that brings judgment is pretty clear in what God says to Samuel. Eli and his sons, if you've been with us through this so far, you'll have seen they have been evil and wicked. It had gone on too long. They knew what they were doing. Everyone around them knew what they were doing. And they just carried on. And so God is going to bring an end to that generation. The idea that they, Eli and his sons, could just go on sinning and sinning and doing evil and evil. And then the next day, give the sacrifices to God and pretend everything was okay was an absolute nonsense. It left a hole, if you like, in the centre of God's people a hole where God and his words were absent despite the outward practices carrying on. There is a little bit, I think, of a warning to us here. It's possible to live a kind of pretense for quite a long time, for years even, and assume that God will do nothing. It is possible for a church to carry on week by week, year by year, doing all sorts of churchy things but where God and his word are absent from their core. And it can become normal. We've probably all experienced a little bit of that drift in our own lives because there doesn't seem to be any immediate impact. God doesn't seem to do anything in that moment. Yet here we see Eli and his sons had crossed a line. It had gone on so long and God was going to act. He was going to come in judgment and he was going to put an end to it. It came up last week in chapter 2, verse 25. And Eli again recognises it this week. The Lord has decided to act. That's what he acknowledges in verse 18, doesn't it? Eli says, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. God delays his judgment because he is wonderfully graceful. He wants people to turn back to him, to return to him. But Eli and his sons had presumed upon his grace for too long. This passage in 1 Samuel is not just a warning that God does see and will act, but it's also a word of hope. It's a word of hope. You're probably all way more godly than me. But do you ever get to that point with someone, you know, when someone's been annoying you, frustrating you, doing things that you just don't like, and you kind of get to the point where you go, you know what, just forget it. I can't be bothered anymore. Just dealing with you is not worth the stress. I don't really care anymore. You might not say it to them, but you just distance yourself as those thoughts go through your head. And in our relationships, it can sometimes reach that point, can't it, where we just can't be bothered anymore. I was talking to a man once, um, a number of years ago now. It was a man who hadn't spoken to his children for over 30 years. He was an older man. And as he said this, I asked him, how do you feel about that? And he said to me, relieved. I was confused because that wasn't exactly where I expected him to go at that moment. But he explained that his sons 
had two sons. His sons, they had been particularly difficult, unkind, endlessly stressful as they moved from teenage years to their early 20s. And one day he just decided that enough was enough. And he'd left them to sort their own lives out and walked away. And that was that. At one level, I and we probably reel a little bit from that kind of disconnection. Yet at another level, you know what I understood? That sense of, if you don't want me, I'm not interested in you. If you're not interested in me, then I'm not going to bother with you. It's played out in my own thoughts and hearts to a lesser extent many times. But here we see in 1 Samuel that God isn't like that. Whilst he won't just ignore evil and rebellion, he also isn't one for just throwing in the towel and saying, forget it, you're on your own. At the start of this section, of this chapter, God's word is rare. By the end of the chapter, God is speaking again. He is making himself known again. He is drawing near and is present with his people again. He is speaking to Samuel and through him to all the people. Listen where we finish. We finish with these words. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Bathsheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel by Shiloh, by the word of the Lord. God doesn't just give up on his people. God's words, they represent his very presence and his action in the world. As he speaks to Samuel and his people, he is present with them and acting among them again. That empty hole in the middle of the life of God's people, but God has chosen to step back into it, to step back into the middle of his people again. That's the pattern we see at every level of creation. Into the darkness and nothingness right at the beginning in a godless world, God brings his word and he comes. He enters into it. God enters into the darkness of this world and he banishes the wicked, the evil, and brings light and new life. From creation, where God spoke into the nothingness and brought life and light. To this moment in 1 Samuel where God steps in again and speaks to his people and brings light and life. To the moment where Jesus was born in a dark world and brought light and life and hope. We read our second reading um, that was read for us was from the start of John's Gospel. And it's really odd. The start of John's Gospel is really odd. It's so familiar, we tend not always to think about it too much. But listen to some of the words. This is what it says at the beginning of John's Gospel. It's speaking of Jesus. Look how it describes him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then carrying on a bit later, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's a bit weird, all the stuff about the word, isn't it? Why not just say Jesus? Well, it's always God's word that brings hope and light and life. When God speaks, he is doing something. When God speaks, he draws near. He makes himself known and he is present in the world. Jesus, God's son, is the clearest word that God ever spoke. He was the epitome, if you like, of what it meant for God's word to come into his world. It's where we see most clearly that God is never going to abandon his people. It's the pattern we see in 1 Samuel lived out. In 1 Samuel, we see this pattern, don't we? We see a rejection of God and his word leads to this growing sense, if you like, of distance between God 
And so his words become increasingly absent and blindness, it grows. But then in the midst of that, God speaks. He acts in judgment and redemption. He speaks again. His words come, they become more frequent, they become more central to the life of the people. God's presence, once again, is with them. And they eventually start to flourish and grow once more. And that's the hope for us, if it feels a bit like autumn. But God doesn't give up on his people. He does see, and he does act, and he does speak. This bit of Samuel points us to the connection between God's word and his presence. God reveals himself to us primarily by his word. It's how we can come to know God himself. It's how Samuel came to know God when he heard his words. And Hebrews, later in the New Testament, says that God has now spoken to us by his Son. And 2 Timothy says that all scripture that you're holding in your hands is breathed out by God. It's all his words to us. Go back to the beginning. Where is a church like St. Clement's by the wardrobe going to find life again? Well, at least it's going to involve drawing near to God through his word. That is a key way in which God has chosen in his wisdom to reveal himself to us so we can know him, so we can draw near. God's words, they are the words of eternal life. It's where we will all find life. All the other things a church can be doing, all the effort and energy a church can expend will seem increasingly hollow if knowing God through his word, through the word, through Jesus, isn't at the core and sitting at the centre. And it's true in our individual lives too, isn't it? That actually we need to know God through his word and that needs to sit at the centre of our lives. It's easy to find yourself in that kind of cycle where God seems distant, so increasingly we ignore his word, so God seems more distant from us and so it goes on in the midst of that we can continue through the motions of church life you can be sat here on a Sunday but it feels increasingly empty and hollow then we feel guilty and ashamed we feel alone we wonder what went wrong and why God feels so far away that's you and it has been probably most of us at some point don't feel embarrassed but equally don't ignore it and pretend everything is fine but remember as we see in 1 Samuel God draws near through his words start to just try and listen to him speak again even in the smallest ways ask someone to send you a message with what they're reading in the God's word each week. Or even if it's just listen to a few minutes of the Bible being read each day at the same time. It's the relationship and the closeness to God that a persistence in listening, reading, hearing God's word that brings life and joy and purpose to all the other things we do. God's word, it brings judgment and it brings hope to us. It reveals God himself to us. Let me pray for us now and then we'll turn and we'll respond in song. And as Pete said earlier, often these songs and these words we sing echo God's very words to us. Let me pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, your final word to us, your complete and perfect word father we thank you that you drew drew near we thank you that we can know you and father where we are distant where we don't hear your words anymore where they are far from us father help us to listen again help us to know your presence with us once more amen